do right very good um, <coughs> so if I can declare the meeting open to the public and remind members that this meeting will be recorded and also ask members to note that all mobile phones must be switched off as they interfere with the recording would you please ensure that your phone is actually switched off not just in silent or airplane mode and can I also remind anyone in the public gallery um, at this stage it is not permissible to bring any electronic devices into the public gallery and can I remind you to declare your interests as appropriate throughout the meeting. Thank you. Um, in respect of the response then to the Minister, if there's, as we've just shown, uh, there's no consensus, you may wish to ask members, would you vote on your response or any comments anyone would like to make? So we're going straight. Sorry. Maybe you'd like uh, to. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, I think it's just, for the record, I think it's critically important um, that as a committee, we do all in our gift to ensure that, that education, which is ultimately the, the, the core and plank mm -hmm. of, of, of our communities and societies, is protected and going forward. Uh, and I think <clears throat> in, increasingly there has been a realisation around the priority in terms of, for example, the, the, the health constraints. Uh, and I think anything less than, than protection uh, of the budget for education, that certainly I would feel that I would be failing in my responsibilities for not having made that case. Okay, thank you, Maeve. And I, I will make the, the point I made before. Is I, I, I think we'd all like to see the education budget protected, but we realise it knocks on every other budget, and therefore we feel that the minister must go in and fight his case. Um, but it shouldn't be ring-fenced, and hence we're voting on the letter. Chris. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with your alluding to there, um, Chair, in that you know, we need to do more to stand together against cuts you know, to, the, to the budget of all departments and, and the, the, the effect <coughs> of sort of the economic policies of the Tory government in Westminster is having upon de departments here. And, but even get, going back to the education side of things here locally, you know, this committee over the last number of months has taken different perspectives on the need to target resources, for example, at um, the private communities. And as a group in the Sinn Féin group, we've always said that we, we agree with the Minister in doing that um, and that we have split it as a committee in various ways. So there are parts of this letter, obviously, that highlight that divide of the committee. Um, so for that reason, we couldn't agree to it. But also, secondly, uh, as my colleagues pointed out, um, on the whole idea of protecting our education budget is just simply too important uh, and that we should be in standing behind our minister to make sure that as much is done as possible because it will be the vulnerable and those kids from socially deprived communities that need as much help as possible if we are to gap to bridge the gap in, in achievement so um, certainly we couldn't agree to any letter of subs substance thank you so, sean um, my position is, you know, when there's part of this letter, I, I do agree with uh, whatever overall and not be able to support it because, um, to me, education is fundamental to the development in, every, in, this, in this particular part of the world in terms of our economy, in terms of everything else. We have particular issues with numeracy and literacy and whatever else, STEM, etc. If we don't get those right, then we can't have the young people going out to get the jobs, etc., whatever. But particularly, as I've said previously, you know, in our constituency offices, we deal on a daily day basis with people who can't get a speech therapist appointment, who have to wait six months or more to get an educational psychologist, the first meeting with them, whatever. And to me, if this cuts made to the educational budget, it is going to be the most vulnerable who are going to suffer first. <clears throat> so that's my position. Trevor, did you want? Uh, well, yes, I, it doesn't give me any pleasure to, to support a ladder like this, but uh, because it would always broadly be in support of trying to fund education adequately, uh, <clears throat> there is a there is a question over how adequately it's funded at the moment. If it was properly run, if we could make some major decisions and make the savings we need, sort out area-based planning. There are a lot of ways we could handle the money that's in education better than we do at the moment. But in, in this situation, the minister has asked us to, to protect. His, his existing budget. At the same time as his party is taking actions in another area of public policy, which is going to have a ruinous effect on, on the budgets. It just doesn't stack up for me, so I'll be supporting the latter as it stands. Okay, thank you. Sandra? Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I'll be supporting the latter as it stands. I mean, it, 
the crucial point in, in that is that you know that we as a committee we are not content with the level of access to the savings delivery plans and you know whenever we uh, meet with people in our own constituency who are complaining about cuts in other departments um, you know those road contractors who are losing their jobs you know within the next couple of months you know um, to to ring fence education budget as much as I would like to have increased a finance coming to this particular department um, because I, I value the education of our young people and, and want to support it as much as I can. I think it should not be ring fenced. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Anyone else? Okay, then we start with about four. And so, Chair, the motion then being that the letter be sent as the committee's response to the minister. So, do, if you want to ask members to indicate by sure. So, a show of hands for those who are in favour of the letter being sent. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, I think. And you got and against. Three. Three. None. No abstentions. So the motion is passed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I move on to um, shared and integrated education inquiry. The clerk has asked me to advise members that a link has been set up in SkyDrive Pro, which will allow members to see submissions to our current inquiry. The clerk will, be, will provide a summary paper on the evidence after the closing date of submissions, which is the 24th of October 2014. Apologies, um, just Mervyn's story at the moment. And Pat, thank you. This is all okay. I can move on to chairperson's business. The all party group on construction. Um, members, for the committee's information, and as previously agreed, I met yesterday with the all-party group on construction to hear their concerns about the delays to the Department of Education's uh, capital programme. I arrived at the meeting having been told that it was they were going to ask me questions and brief me to find that I was the one to brief them. The um, meeting had produced a very good <coughs> brief on all the different schools, bills, both capital programs, maintenance and others, and where each of them were, and to try and summarise exactly where each school is and what's holding them back. In some cases it's planning, in some cases they haven't passed the economic um, assessment. And so in the end I decided the best thing to do was to give the clerk's briefing document, which he'd given me, which is very good, very thorough, and I'm very grateful for it, to all of them so they can actually look through each school and see what each of the problems are and then come back to us. So that's really where I, where I left that. Um, <coughs> so I hope you're all happy with me having done that. Trevor, any? Peter. Cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was at the, the meeting, as you know, Danny. Um, I suppose what struck me was the, the complete lack of progress that, yes. that that document did demonstrate, just how little, like, well, not say activity, there's been a lot of activity but no foundations dug, except for one or two honourable exceptions. So, um, and that's in some cases over, well over two years on yep. from the original announcement, you know. So the, the wheels do grind slowly up here as we know, but this is ridiculous. And I think then it becomes, the onus comes on us to try and find ways of pushing it and faster and then necessarily working through other committees to push, whether it's planning or other things to work quickly. Um, so it remains a, an area of scrutiny for the committee. And so the committee will be seeking a briefing on the revised capital um, protocol, including the new gateway messages. Okay. Yeah, sure. It, it, it does actually raise quite an interesting issue. Um, if there are other school projects sitting there with all of those boxes ticked, why does it not move on? Yeah. You know, we, we, we just sit in this dilemma where nothing happens. You know, and some of these issues will not be settled for years. Right. It's not. It's not as if they're going to be settled in a few months. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've often, <coughs> often wondered about this because the minister made a big play about off-the-shelf projects. I yeah. think is the terminology he used, where, where he quite rightly says, you know, all of these things should be planning permission, business case, everything should be in place before he mm -hmm. gives the go-ahead. But yet, there's a long, long list of of projects out there where that hasn't been the case. But we're stuck because 
you know, because they're there, he does not move on to projects that are ready to go. So are you s saying we want to wait till we've had a brief to find a way on, or do we actually want him, want to write to him and ask him to try and include a whole mass more so that they become, if I can use that awful term, shovel ready on, on the shelf? Because I got the idea that the gateway system was to get everything right down the line so that the moment there was funding and he could make the decision, it was put it on the table. So is that what we'd like to do? <coughs> I think, Chair, just for... Well, we would like an explanation for yeah. why that doesn't happen, if you know what I mean. The committee had written to the department mm -hmm. about this. There are 39 um, live capital projects. About half of those, maybe a few less, um, will be, if I understand correctly, spades in the ground within the next 12 months, and the rest will be spades in the ground um, at least a year out, about a year after that. This is the information that the department provided to us previously. So those projects there was a certain protocol applied to those and the department has since revised the protocol so that there's an uh, a gateway step where all of those boxes have to be ticked but the committee actually asked the question what about those that are already advanced in planning will they be reassessed and the answer is no they're still on the books they're still going to happen um, but any new projects will be subject to the new gateway and that's what the briefing from the department yeah. uh, mm -hmm. was so that satisfies or I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with all this. You, you, do, you do wonder when, when there's an announcement of, you know, 12 or 13, you know, a dramatic announcement of that number of new builds that have been agreed. Um, is, is that a complete surprise to the schools involved? Or have they had some prior knowledge? Mm -hmm. Or should they have had some prior knowledge? Because it's, it's okay saying you can get everything ready to go, you know, through the gateway and so on. But uh, as soon as the minister gives the go ahead and the funding's there, off you go, start digging. But uh, there's quite a bit of expense involved in that. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big process to put together a development proposal. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, is there not some way that, that you know, schools could be given an indication that, that they're at least well up the list or mm -hmm. it's worthwhile to put something together? And it's all a bit speculative, I think, at the moment. Because it was rather like the road system that we used to see in council, where if we got everything on the list, you could see at least it was on the list, yeah, even well, if it was five, ten years it away. Must be, a, must be some way to establish priority. Called a forward work program, Chair. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, heard of them. I think I'm sensing from members that want to write to the department again on this important issue and just seek an explanation about how this, how this process, how we got to the point that we've got to. Um, Chair, Do we want to be stronger than that and request that they look at? Well, um, bringing more <coughs> schools onto I think that's subject to cost. That's actually what the department is doing through the school enhancement program. Those were 51 projects, smaller mm -hmm. projects that were more likely to be shovel ready. So I think that was, I hope I'm not doing the department a disservice, but their plan would to be, it would be like roads, yep. more like Northern Ireland water. You would have like a number of divisions, if you will, like mm -hmm. in football. Mm -hmm. So you have the Premier League ones, those that are ready to go, no problems, <coughs> excuse me, and those which are, you know, more Vauxhall Conference further down the league. But as things went wrong, some would be um, promoted and some would be relegated. And that's, yeah. that's how it goes in capital, and that way you make sure you get okay. your money spent, is my understanding. Sorry, Chair. Okay. Sure, to, to play fair, I, I do think the boards actually have a priority list mm -hmm. of new school okay. bills, which they forward to the department. Now, don't ask me how the department then decides out of the five boards which is the highest priority or whatever i've no idea and that would be worth having a, or getting yeah, an explanation yeah. on because i know at the minute they get five lists mm -hmm. as such so it would be fascinating to get an understanding of how that is prioritized because that's obviously where the minister's priorities come yeah. from so let's go back Check. to the briefing Indeed, actually, there's a protocol, there's a scoring system, mm. and it, it is actually set out how they've done it. And that mm. scoring system has been altered now, so that yeah. uh, in future it will be around things like FSME and SENLA, et cetera. Committee needs a briefing. So we need the briefing sure. if we can ask for that as soon yep. as possible. Okay. okay. Thank you. Like We're going to move on to the um, PEAT meeting. Um, for members' information, the chairperson the met with parents' education as autism therapists. PEAT.
um, on Monday. Pete provided some information on their activities and in particular their big lottery funded project for educational inclusion for young people with autism spectrum disorder and I expect Pete to write to the committee shortly on relevant issues. Okay. If we can then move to the draft minutes of the previous meeting which was held 10th of September at pages 16 to 20 of the pack. Are there any comments on the draft minutes? Are they agreed? Thank you. <coughs> and then move on to primary school area plans. We will now receive a briefing from the committee's special advisor on the recent published <coughs> primary school area plans. The clerk's cover note is at pages 22 to 24, and you also find recent and previous briefing papers from Professor Gallagher. He was there a second ago. The hour. Good morning. morning. Thank you very much, Tony. We look forward to all you have to say in ten, ten minutes, please. Okay. Well, I'll keep my comments fairly brief. The, the paper that I submitted um, was was fairly brief. Um, when you look through the uh, the various um, uh, reports from the boards. Uh, on the, uh, the primary schools, uh, essentially it, it's reached like a technical exercise applying the sustainability criteria which have been applied through the, uh, the process. Uh, and the report details various recommendations and decisions that have been made with the, uh, the managing authorities around closures, mergers, amalgamations, whatever. Um, I was quite struck. Uh, they all work with a largely similar, or describe a largely similar policy framework. But unlike, I think, the post-primary one, there's a, there's a bit of nuance and difference between them, which I thought was quite interesting, in particular in relation to discussions on shared education. All of them mention them, uh, but in three of the boards, they're mentioned and then largely uh, not returned to. Uh, two of the board reports uh, go into uh, quite a bit more detail. The Northeastern Board talks about the, um, uh, the gains of the PIE project, and there's a few uh, proposals for shared education that come through, uh, I think largely as a result of the, the PIE initiative, which the board was running for many years. And the Western Board, uh, this again describes in, in fairly effusive terms the work of the Fermanagh Trust um, and I think virtually, uh, not every, but virtually every primary school in the Fermanagh is uh, involved in some shared education proposal uh, or, or another, but there's no proposal for shared education in any, of the, in any other county uh, in, the, uh, in the Western Board area. And that's, what that suggests to me is that where people are working on the ground with schools to explore this, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of ideas, but when it's a top-down process run by the sectors, the same uh, sort of energy and commitment doesn't seem to be there, so I just was quite struck by that as a particular as a particular issue. Um, the uh, I was also quite struck um, that there weren't th that many innovative proposals around integrated education, although again this was cited as a policy imperative. Um, and since the reports came out, I think we've had the court case, um, and I think everyone understands that that has implications. Although no one's quite sure what the implications are at this point. Um, but I mean, clearly, there's, there's something there as a sort of a, as, a, as an issue. Uh, but I suppose the biggest point uh, that uh, struck me, looking at the, at the reports uh, as a whole, was the, um, the fundamental premises upon which the analysis or the, the, mm -hmm. the work was carried out. Uh, because if you look at the, the original uh, viability audit data, there's a relatively small proportion of the primary schools are seen to be under attainment stress. There's a relatively small proportion are in formal intervention, but there's quite a lot of them are identified as being uh, under stress because of their en enrollment levels. And the small, the small schools are seen in, uh, it's, there's a sort of an assumption in the report that small schools are educationally deficient and that the exercise is about trying to rationalise uh, and remove um, uh, non-sustainable small schools from within the system. But the viability audit data itself doesn't support that contention. Uh, there's no uh, relationship between size and attainment. Uh, there's a very, very limited relationship mm -hmm. between size even and financial stress. And so I, that was the thing that struck me most of all, the fundamental <coughs> premise that seems to underpin uh, the, the entire process. Uh, it doesn't seem to be, to be supported by the evidence that was presented mm -hmm. as the evidence base for the process. Thank you. Um, I've got various questions in different ways. I mean, the, the area learning communities are sort of different in every area, but when it comes to shared education, they are 
the main driver? Are they getting properly pulled into the area planning process or being left slightly out in, in the cold? I just feel sometimes we're working in two different directions. Uh, well, I suppose that the, the, uh, the, the, this process, uh, particularly with primary schools, was centred around the sort of key set of criteria and the, 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 um, the management authorities working together. Uh, looking at the various their, their sets of schools separately mm -hmm. using these criteria um, and then bringing forward proposals and where the, um, there was connections between them they started to look in some of those areas at, at shared or other innovative options but those mainly seem to be proposals coming from the schools themselves rather than the sectoral, mm -hmm. sectoral bodies. There's not much of a sense that uh, uh, there's any concept conceptualisation of very learning communities engaging in this process but if the sectors were looking at their schools separately, then they wouldn't be bringing, the, yeah. the ALCs wouldn't be part of that, that thinking. When we had all the, um, we had principals up or stakeholders, they were asking for facilitators as well, and yet this seems to be two angles. You almost need a facilitator for the sharing side, to try and pull the sectors together and look at it from that point of view, and that doesn't exist. Yeah. There seems to be no evidence of facilitators anyway to help the schools that have been told, look at either sharing or amalgamating or, yeah. or whatever. Well, I, think, I, mean, I, I suspect the Education Library Boards will, would make their own case about the extent of consultation uh, uh, that they carried out. Um, some of them talk about it in more or less detail in the reports and so I think they would probably argue that they, that they uh, uh, did make an attempt to try and engage with people and look at options but when you, when you look at some of the, the evidence of what's coming forward the most in innovative uh, options appear to have come from places where people were working directly with the schools to explore options mm -hmm. where that wasn't happening and it was the sector led process and it seemed to be very much a top down process and there didn't seem to be that much evidence of, of real innovation and creativity and, uh, at least as far as I could see. Before I move to members, is there any evidence of the boards sharing best practice between each other or anyone pooling? Well, the department, I think, coordinated work across the, the boards, oh. but it, it does look very much like a top-down technical application of the criteria. Um, so from that point of view, it looks as if it was rolled out in a fairly similar way with the nuanced bit around the experience of the northeastern and the western boards because of the particular initiatives that were carried out in those areas. But it looks very much, very much top-down to me. Okay, thank you. Sandra. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Hi, Tony, thanks for, for that information. Um, I thought it was really interesting, um, that pattern um, that, you could per that you perceive of the viability audit, uh, and that money is what drives the whole thing. Yeah. You know, and so, at the end of the day, whatever you're, you're saving, uh, at closing small rural schools, it's going to cost families and it's going to cost communities. Yeah. And decisions need to be made on the, the bigger picture um, and hence the need for, for joined up government, basically. Um, just one aspect that I wondered, and maybe it's because I'm new to the committee, I don't know, but um, the review considered the number of empty spaces in a school. Now, where do those figures come from? Is it back to where when a school was built? Like those figures could be fifty years old, surely. And I mean, if I look at my my own local primary school and the the, the numbers that, that school is supposed to take, they couldn't possibly deal with those sort of numbers because of the way the building has uh, changed over the years and how they make use of that building. Do you, are those figures out of date? And are those, <coughs> is that something that's that should be considered? Well, I mean, the, the department, uh, I guess, probably would be able to explain that whatever technical aspects there are to identifying the uh, enrolment numbers for schools. But but essentially, uh, schools are all all having a notional capacity, um, and a key part of this process has been to look at the the, the notional capacity in schools as against the actual capacity, um, with the argument that is um, one of the sort of inefficiencies in the system that needs to be addressed. Um, you may recall from the, the post-primary data, the 25-year projection actually suggested that the, uh, most of the empty space would be used up because there's a projected increase in numbers. Mm -hmm. um, for the primary schools, it's different because the, the level of there's relatively little change over the 25-year projection, so the expectation is that the level of unused space at the moment will largely still be, be there. With, as part of the process. Uh, but you're right, I mean, when schools are, schools are often built at a particular point in time and populations change and demographics change and people move around, there's been increased urbanisation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the factors. In a previous report, 
um, I did for uh, many, some years ago for um, for another organisation. One of the arguments I made is it's, it's like your point about joined up practice that uh, since uh, this high variability in terms of the financial status <coughs> of these small rural schools, and in some cases because they have spare space that they don't use that they once did use because of change in demographics but that space that could be used for other purposes for community purposes mm -hmm. the school is a resource in the community and it could be used in a variety of ways but it does require people thinking a little bit more creatively about that um, so there's, there's I, mean, I think the, 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 the enrollment number probably is a, is a realistic number um, the, uh, but schools aren't on wheels and you can't just keep shifting them around. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Is that enrolment number really realistic? Because the way people teach have changed over the 50 yeah. years and maybe the space that they need to teach those children because they're changed, teaching them in different ways. The curriculum changes. You know, they do different things. You know, they maybe actually use bigger space than what they would have yeah. had sits at the desk all day I mean, 50 the, years the, ago. Yeah, the other factor in here is the, the assumed minimum enrolment number, hmm. which um, I think in this is around about 105 or something. Uh, the, uh, low, the CCMS, I think, argue for a slightly lower number. But I think there's question marks. Uh, those, those minimum enrolment numbers were put in place, I think, coming out of the, the Bain report in 2006. Uh, well, that preceded. Um, the, uh, the encouragement of collaboration um, and didn't take into account the possibility that two small schools working collaboratively could provide a viable option in an area where each school considered separately uh, as if the other didn't exist didn't meet those sort of criteria uh, so the um, the uh, that minimum enrollment number I think is is based also on a number of assumptions which don't seem to be borne out by uh, by some of the evidence which the, this process is, uh, is supposedly based on I thought it was interesting, sorry, you know, how the, the shared education seemed to, and there was a the concerted effort to continue it in Fermanagh where there was a funded project and yeah. in Pai, a, I know a couple of areas in, in the Northern Eastern Education Library Board where they still try to continue that, you know, so it, it just shows how an investment in that. Sure. Uh, inspires people to, to do their best to continue that. Well, I think the, the Western Board report also uh, details as part of its consultation, the sur they did a survey and there, was, there just appeared to be quite a lot of enthusiasm uh, for the idea of schools working together like that. Um, and it just reinforces that point that where there's actual facilitation of schools to explore those options, to try them out and see if they can work, there appears to be an awful lot of support for it. But that, if, you, if it's all a top-down process driven by each of the sector separately, there's no particular encouragement or facilitation of that, and so the, the mm -hmm. proposals don't emerge. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Chris. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Tony. I think to say it's anything less than a thought-provoking paper with... Um, certainly not do it justice, but can I concentrate on the sharing aspect? Um, was there a minimum baseline of sharing that was requested of the? No, I don't no. think so. No, it was the the uh, trying to develop sort of innovative and creative uh, solutions based on sharing was encouraged by the minister. I mean, the Western <coughs> Board did. Both the ministers talking about this as one of the yeah. most important sort of developments. Um, but so it was left up to the sectors to explore that. Um, as I say, my interpretation of the way the data have fallen out is that if you didn't have people working to facilitate this and to explore it on the ground, then it didn't emerge. Yeah, and that's where I was going to lead to because it's, it's quite clear that there, you know, that hasn't happened. Yeah. And, and you can connect, and I think you're right to connect it to the to the aspect of it being seen as top down. Yeah. And for me, if a community is locked out, y you lose some creative thinking. Yeah. Is there a way to build that into the process at the minute? Um, well, it, re it requires the, um, uh, a change in the process, so it isn't simply a top-down process. I mean, we do have lots of experience that for the last 10 years, apart from North Eastern Board and Fermanagh Trust, we've been doing it as well in the shared education programme, largely at post-primary level. So it can be done, and we can see positive benefit. There's an announcement today, I think, about some uh, new initiative in this, this area, and so there's, there's, there's resources and support for it. Um, so th there's, there's, there, there appear to be resources and a willingness to try some of this stuff out, but we just need to allow those bottom processes and facilitate those bottom up processes to operate would a minimum baseline of what was you know expected help would it if it was set in place at a minimum baseline that you must well i guess if people were given targets to try and achieve it would encourage uh, if people are just given an aspiration um the without a process then it looks like nothing much happens so if there were specific sort of targets <coughs> presented or further incentives then maybe there would be more evidence of it thanks yeah, thanks for Jonathan. Thanks, Chair. Well, there's a bit of a bleak picture you're actually painting here. There's very little 
out of the box thinking, very little innovation within the process. People are just following the guidelines or rules and ticking boxes. Would that be a right way to assess what's being said here? Well, my sense is that there were a set of criteria that were agreed and were applied in a fairly technical way. Um, and to that extent, there, there doesn't seem to be need to be much evidence of innovative thinking. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's that's the process. That's how it was how it was operated. Yeah, because uh, I, I know from my own personal experience uh, of my own constituency, it, it ended up the politicians doing the out of box thinking. Yeah. You know, because when you're looking at schools which get down to three, four classrooms, and they're stuck. The last thing you want to see is that community isolated, sure. the school closing or whatever. But the, we have to be honest about this. The biggest cost in any school is not the actual physical building or the running of it. It's, it's the staff within yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know, I haven't seen any evidence yet of out-of-the-box thinking with regard to, you know, we talked about shared education between sectors. Yeah. What about shared education with regards to sharing the management of the schools themselves? Yeah. You know, I haven't even seen any evidence of that. And whenever you raised it, all you were met with was a barrage of issues around unions and I don't know what at all. And you're given five million reasons why you can't do it. Yeah. Yet the natural consequence of that is ultimately the school will close. Yeah. Which is not to the community's benefit. It's not to the department's benefit, it's to nobody's benefit. Sure. I mean, there's, there's, there's some examples of those sorts of contradictory tensions. There's one, one of the area uh, uh, board reports talks about any proposals for shared education have to be done within existing legislative frameworks. A different repo uh, uh, report says that any proposals for shared education require new legislative frameworks. Yeah, so they're saying different things. Um, and uh, I suppose, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, if, if there's particular proposals to close or to merge or amalgamate a school, it requires a, a development proposal, and then it would be a much more sort of widespread local process around it. And in that situation, where politicians and other invo others are involved, maybe that's when the sort of discussions that should have been taking place previously um, uh, start to happen. Um, the, uh, you know, maybe in, in this sort of a pr process, because this is an ongoing process, you know, they say this very clearly, this, is, this will take a long time to play this whole, this whole process out, and there's still lots of work to be done. Maybe there's still an opportunity to try and be much more proactive at encouraging those local conversations to explore uh, a, a wider variety of local options, because there's no doubt there are a, r a range of ways that could be done, uh, that sharing and collaboration can involve the sharing of all sorts of things, including even federal, uh, federated models, where you have this uh, single management structure for a, a federation of schools working together. So there are a wide range of options if people are prepared to uh, allow those options to be considered, explored and, and in some cases put into place? But I think you're right, Tony. I think the difficulty is people don't enter into those conversations until the inevitable big C word is actually yeah. used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by that stage it's way too late for everyone. Oh. You know, and maybe that's something uh, the board or the department or the minister or somebody needs to drive forward having those conversations before you ever get there. Yeah. You know, because I can think of several schools <clears throat> in my own constituency in that situation, but their heads are firmly buried in the ground and they're just not addressing the issue. It says every school wants to fight its own corner first. Mm. I'll see if I'm right. So that's a good point. Um, sure. Thanks, Tony, and again, thank you for a great piece of work. Tony, just, just going on from, from that last point, are there any examples in Northern Ireland where federation work, where management is shared, or where perhaps one rural school is key stage one and a neighbouring one mm -hmm. is key stage two? Or, I'm, not, I'm, not at all. I'm not aware of, personally of any at the moment. I know that the, um, there was a project run some years ago by the Regional Training Unit uh, looking at federation, because uh, there had been a debate at previous period about small rural schools. And there was examples of, of federal models in some parts of England, uh, and there were some pilots done in, in Northern Ireland around federated models. I'm not sure. I don't think they were picked up by the department, and when the pilot ended, it ended. Um, but there's certainly plenty of examples of that type of model in other jurisdictions. In England and in Scotland. Probably. Well, well, yeah, yeah, certainly in England, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just on another point there, um, the Western Board, less than 86 pupils and two teachers. Are there many schools in the category of, say, 60 or more pupils and just two teachers? 
oh, I'd, I'd need to check the data for that. I mean, there's, there's quite a there's quite a long uh, there's quite a sort of diverse distribution of schools. A lot there's a lot of fewer sm very small schools than there were in the past, but there are still some around. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when when I look, somebody else referred to your 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 bar chart in terms of uh, consideration in the future, uh, in terms of um, unfilled places versus projected demand. You know, when you look at particularly the Southern Education Library Board, if you don't look at it too closely, uh, the, the projected demand nearly near covers the unfilled places at the minute. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's uh, the point in, in relation to the post-primary schools. The, virtually all of the unfilled places at present are used up in the 25-year projections. The same pattern overall doesn't occur with the primary schools. This is a slight reduction, but it varies across the boards. But the projections at primary level are a bit harder because you're, you're looking at... Uh, uh, assumed patterns of population growth. At least at the post-primary level, you have a primary cohort that gives you some years of reasonable uh, predictability in terms of population patterns. Thank you. And in terms of our rural schools, there it talks about measuring the community engagement factors and and um, ge sure. geographical isolation. Has there any studies been done in areas to look at the community impact of a closure of a small rural schools? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not a, not aware of any. Um, the uh, one of the things I've often been very struck at in the past, whenever there were proposals to to close small schools, in some communities, the extent to which people rally around the school can often be quite extraordinary, and the extent to which you can pull people together because they see schools as such an important social institution in the community as a tie between the in the, in the community. And I know there's there. I think there was some work in um, by the inspectorate in England some years ago, which talked about some of the broader consequences of, of closing schools in rural communities and how that was the beginning of the death knell of some communities. Once you remove one of those, some of those key institutions, the community starts to, to dissipate or change quite radically. So are you saying some work has been done in England? Well, I think yeah. there's yeah, some yeah. work, I have a memory of some work that the inspector did in, in, in looking at that. It, the problem is it's not a local school and your families aren't going to move into yeah. an area yeah. and there's no, there's, no, there's no where to send the children and so it, different patterns start to emerge. <clears throat> So, and it can be part of a process of encouraging urbanisation. Thank you. Thank you. On, on, on the back of that, I mean, the Scottish system for the presumption against closure at least gave every community the chance to fight that corner. Right. Yeah. Well, there must be some things we've learned from there that the effects on. Yeah, there may well be. Yeah, I'm done. Off the top of my head, I'm not aware yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Trevor. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Again, <laughs> it's always interesting. Um, you, you, you did mention today's announcement in response to Chris's question, so I think it's only fair that I could put it on the record that uh, my, my impression of Atlantic Philanthropies, and they do marvellous work, is that uh, their, their ultimate goal when they put money into education over here is to see children being educated together. <clears throat> so they may call it shared education, but and I, I, don't, I have no problem with them putting money into shared programmes. But what, what they're aiming for as, as the ultimate, which is uh, Protestant and Catholic children under the same roof. Uh, so encourage them, certainly. The, the, the big problem I have with all this is, is the, the amount of money we're possibly spending on schools, which may well be under threat of closure. You know, I mean, the, the, the maintenance budget, I think mm -hmm. we heard a figure yesterday, 298 million, I think it was, outstanding. Um, but we all, this is a construction group. But we, we also heard from a, a contractor that uh, there's some quite serious work being done in terms of fire safety on some schools, which are implicitly under threat of closure. And that, that distresses me. You know, we can't, we can't get the decisions taken. And as this whole process rolls on and on, I mean, I a feeling if you and I were in charge of it, we might get something done. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it is really sales pace. Uh, and I, it, it's going to be further complicated now by the fact that if, if things go according to plan, there's going to be a change from five boards to one board. <laughs> it's just the mind boggles at what might, what, how long all this might take, and how long, how much of an excuse that's going to give the department and the boards to put these decisions off again, even longer. Um, do you think is, is there a real? Do you get the impression there's a real appetite amongst the people who? Who matter, or is it just a case that that schools can continue to, as Jonathan says, to bury their head in the sand, 
um, because they know there's not going to be decisions taken. And the easy, the easy option is not to take decisions. Um, I suppose, I'm not sure, uh, I have an impression that uh, among people who work in education that the, uh, there had been, had been a, a sort of a, a hope that with devolution, education would have been a superordinate goal for everyone, mm -hmm. uh, something that everyone could mm -hmm. get behind because it's about the future of our children. And I, th I, I suspect there's a, there's a degree of disappointment that um, education issues have become so politicised and so many things got stuck and mm -hmm. so many decisions weren't made and so many initiatives that were started didn't get anywhere. Um, uh, but that's just that's an impression that I think uh, uh, it's a sense I get that a lot of people have disappointment that we haven't achieved more. Um, there's no doubt in the particular context what you're saying, uh, given the divisions we have in our system with grammar and secondary schools, between the different denominations, the integrated schools, Irish medium mm -hmm. schools, uh, if you compare us to, uh, to other jurisdictions, we have a larger number of schools and they tend to be on average smaller in comparison to other jurisdictions. Uh, now there's no, <clears throat> once you get above a certain size, there's no correlation between uh, run, per people running costs and, and schools, but it will have an impact on maintenance budgets and this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, they, there's a sort of a balance to be struck there between recognising uh, people's right to have, uh, different sectors' right to have their own schools, and at the same time, the, the sort of broader uh, common good that everyone should be working towards to try and ensure we have an education system which is as efficient as possible and is working as effectively as, as possible. Uh, and there are challenges, there's no doubt, uh, in terms of the efficiency and effectiveness of the system, in terms of the wide variability in outcomes for young people. And the, the very close relationship between education and social disadvantage. There's a whole range of different yeah. things that need to be tackled. Um, and as I say, I think a lot of people working in education might have hoped that there would be an opportunity for everyone to pull together and rally around this as a common cause. Um, but uh, the experience hasn't exactly been like that. Yeah. I must say, you, you, you do reference the, the work of the Fermanagh Trust. Yeah. We were down there a couple of months ago. Um, and the, and the, the, the people that are operating down there make no bones about it. If they their, their sharing program is going very well, uh, but if if it ultimately leads to schools coming together under one roof, they they wouldn't. They, they think that if the fact that this program is going well and people are being brought together will actually ease that that evolution to. Uh, you know, the only word I can think of is integrated, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And that would partially solve the problem of having too many schools. Yeah, no, I mean, I think most people who work in shared education uh, are, believe that the, the, the dynamic that it creates between schools working collaboratively is, is positive for the schools. It's positive for teachers because it broadens the, the range of expertise and experience that they can draw on yeah. and it widens the, the range of opportunity for young people. Um, and if it creates a dynamic that people want to make decisions about further change in future, then that's that's perfectly uh, it's entirely up to them. I don't. I think most shared education issues don't begin with the prescribed long-term outcome, but it's up to people oh, yeah. to make their own decisions about where they want to take it, and that's yeah, yeah. You know, perfectly legitimate. Well, they, 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 they begin with the need to bring classes together, yeah. to deliver the full curriculum, but we would not start that discussion, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's basic and, and absolutely, well, absolutely correct. But that, well, we'll see where it leads. But I, I just get the feeling with this whole process that we'd we'll be sitting here in two years' time having the same discussion. You know? Yeah. You know? yeah. I don't think that's a possibility, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> on that, Tony, I mean, the, I think I remember asking a question when this all started on the figures, the numbers that it was all being planned to work on of empty spaces and others, and they said there was something like a 10% variation. Well, if you're, going to, if you're going to allow some degree of choice, you have to have some spare capacity, because if every school was full, then uh, people wouldn't have choice. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some spare capacity in the system in order to facilitate choice. And then when you have, when you have different sectors and they, they don't operate uh, religious bars and entry, then there can be a degree of movement across sectors as well, so that mm -hmm. you also require mm -hmm. a, a degree of... Uh, a degree of... of um, Is there any evidence of reviewing the figures as we go along? Because they, when we're now... Nearly four years into it, aren't we? And yeah. And figures will change. Well, as, I mean, as saying that's the sense because there's a number of different sort of uh, benchmarks that are involved here. One is the, the assumed minimum threshold that's appropriate, and the, 
can argue a lot about that. Um, there's the, uh, the uh, assumed uh, enrolment figure for a school of what it ought to have. But if, that's, if the actual figure is below an assumed figure, that mm -hmm. opens up the possibility of using that facility for other... It's a, it's a public space. It could be used for other things. So it, it shouldn't be seen just as an exercise carried out simply by itself. It shouldn't be seen in, in isolation like that, I think, particularly in rural communities because the availability of public space for community use is actually quite important in rural communities. And so schools shouldn't be seen simply just as schools. They should be seen that. as that broader public space uh, with the opportunity for it being used creatively for other things. Before I go to Trevor, the other thing going through is anyone actually looked at the cost of transport? If you think of the change in moving children, it's not just the, you know, the cost of petrol, it's the machinery, it's the people who work yeah. in that whole system and how it changes everybody's lives because you've all got to plan your life around getting yeah. your children to school. Is, is there any element of that in the Well, the, the department has, has some figures on the, the cost of moving uh, children around on a day and daily basis and I can't remember the exact figure but the last figure I heard was horrendously high um, the, uh, and so there's obviously there's huge cost involved in that and I think that's simply the cost of just moving them. It does all the other sort of uh, opportunity costs that come with that but that is a big big factor if if uh, most children went to local schools we would spend an awful lot less money on on busing them around no yes, i wondered if there's a graph has ever been produced that's shown the cost of moving children <coughs> up because yeah, i, I, haven't, I getting... haven't seen such a thing but i'm pretty sure it would be easy to produce yeah no thank you Trevor. yeah sorry to come back in chairman but it's just about the the, the figures the uh, vacancy figures because we may have, have discussed that yeah. So many times, our our figure got up to eighty five thousand at one time, mm -hmm. uh, but we eventually asked the department to try and quantify it properly, and I think it came down to about seventy or sixty five, sixty seven, mm -hmm. something like that. But it's probably about as accurate as the eighty five, really, because nobody really knows. Yeah. The, the I go back to the maintenance budget. Uh, you know, Sandra's question, the very right start about uh, you know what 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 figure does the department use? Well, of course they use the the approved enrolment figure, but that that can go out of date, as you rightly say, uh, because of lack of maintenance. It, it probably includes capacity in porta cabins, which mm -hmm. have, frankly you wouldn't let a, an adult step into in case he went through the floor, because they've been around so long. And I've been in a school where where there are actually porta cabins that they can't use. So I mean the, the whole thing is so nebulous, but. No matter what way you look at it, you would you would have to think there's there's a figure of around forty five, fifty thousand empty places in primary schools. You know? I mean it must must be. Uh when you gotta look at the figures, make some assumptions about wear and tear and you still come to that kind of figure. So it's 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 serious. Yeah. Well, it's, it's part of the basis on which this entire exercise is predicated, yeah. that there were empty spaces. Uh, but then the other assumption arises from that, that schools that have l uh, low enrolments are somehow other educationally deficient. And that particular assumption, I think, is actually questioned by the, the evidence produced Absolutely, by yeah. the process. Um, where we have schools where there's underutilised space, um, you know, there's an issue there because it can often be a cost around rates and maintenance mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. else associated with that. Um, but if we set it in a broader context, a joined up context mm -hmm. that Sandra talked about, then we can start to think about other ways in which that space might be fruitfully used. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, thank okay. you very much. And thank you for all your hard work and an excellent thank document. Very okay. Very, very grateful. <coughs> right, it was a great deal in that. Um, um, does the um, committee want to ask the special advisor for some further info on some of the things that you touched on then, the RCU um, federated, um, federal federated uh, models, pilots, uh, the impact of closure in other jurisdictions? Um, uh, I just couldn't remember off the top of his head whether uh, there was a, what the information was, so I'll ask him for that. Additionally, just to remind members that we have the department. Uh, and the ELBs and CCMS on the 8th of October, mm -hmm. talking about the area plans. Sorry, Terry, to keep talking, but just to be clear, what I'd actually originally asked the department to do was, since the department runs the steering group, that um, somebody from the steering group, so including people from the board, CCMS and the department, would all come together and the committee could ask them all about the plans, all about the strategy, etc. The department said no. Um, they didn't want to do that. Um, they want to come separately from um, the boards and CCMS. So what I'd suggest, members, is that boards and CCMS come first, talk about their mm -hmm. five plans, 
and then the committee can then ask the department, uh, what are you doing um, you know, strategically, corporately, to ensure that they, everybody does the same thing, that you share best practice, and that you're encouraging the ELBs to provide facilitators for shared education. Mm -hmm. Does that sound acceptable, members? It does. I think each of us have probably got a few more headings that come into it. And, I mean, the top-down approach was the main comment at the beginning. We need to find a way of working better on the ground with the communities and bringing them into the system. Um, sorry. You know, I, I, I think the other point here that's come up on a lot of people's request this morning is shared education. And I remember at the Fermanagh Trust meeting, there was a department official there who said it was um, they were developing a, well, it was a baseline for shared education. But, you know, we have ranging from the annual football match to what yep. Trevor, what, what we all want, where children are educated under the same roof. Um, I wonder, has the department done an audit? of the level of shared education throughout primary and post-primary. Because yeah. until we have that, I think you know, schools know where they sit on this scale of one to five in terms of shared education and what as Tony talked about targets that need mm -hmm. to be up to. Mm -hmm. well, that's why I raised the area of learning communities. Yeah, the very, it's, very it's, good it's, one. It's, yeah. it's part of it. Um, Chair, just for members' information, yeah, the department has. They do an annual school omnibus survey, and the last one they did, they asked about um, shared education. I'll send members the um, findings from it, but it was like something like two thirds to seventy-five percent of schools indicated they were involved in shared education. But I think I'm right in saying most were single classes, so it was some kind of single class interaction. Very few were around the, the whole school interaction, and I don't think they were put on that one to five scale from the uh, the pie. Uh, okay. or indeed from the Fermanagh Shared Education Programme, but I'll send members that info and I will um, uh, give the department the heads up that when they come on the 8th, members will want to know about that as well. I think it would be very, very useful for schools as well to know where they were on the yeah. scale and what the targets had it. I thought we were getting from the department a new step-by-step -step process that was moving, so too. moving up and I think mm. that was at the very end of <coughs> the, the summer. I think, Chair, that was, actually, that was in the PIE project, if yeah. I recall correctly, and also I think the Fermanagh Shared Education yeah. Programme, they used that too. Okay. Um, but uh, I will ask the department to uh, just confirm whether they were actually, <coughs> that's going to be part of the shared education programmes um, that they are bringing forward in 1415. The other two issues I had was Jonathan's one on governors and whether we're looking at <coughs> you know, better ways forward on that, and another was maintenance of maintaining schools and where they fit into it. Sorry, what was, what was the one about governors? The point on governors, if I understood it, Jonathan, was um, if you're looking at putting schools together, is anyone working at how governors can work together with lots? Uh, I uh, joined up governors. I think someone actually, I think it was Tony, used the expression federal yeah, groups of, of schools. Yeah, so these you know, where you share <coughs> the management around a number of smaller schools, so you don't have to actually close the facility, but you've massively reduced its overheads. So these, these federated models, and Tony also referred mm. to an RTU study, so I think it's that what mm. members are after. And okay. transport, I added in. in I think we're going to hear about transport. Oh, we're going to hear We will do. Review. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, anything else then um, <coughs> to include? Okay, thank you. We can now move on to um, teacher deregistration. Um, we're now going to receive a briefing from the GTCNI on proposed um, Department of Education regulations, some of which relate to the deregistration of teachers. GTCNI will also advise us on its resource position. Um, the clerk's cover note is at pages 48 to 52. You will also find a briefing paper and previous correspondence from GTCNI. The relevant proposed rule, the Minister's written statement on teacher eligibility, and a copy of another relevant rule. There's also related correspondence from the Department and tabled items. And we welcome you very much today. So, Carmel Gallagher, Ivan Arbuthnot, and Jerry Devlin, very welcome today. Um, you have 10 minutes, don't have to use it all. But okay. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. You'll be glad to know that we hope not to use the full <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, we're aware that the matter came to light by a discovery of an unintended repeal of previous legislation and that no regulations are currently in place to provide assurance to the Assembly and the, the public in relation to the regulation of the teaching profession. Um, 
We know that uh, the proposal to amend legislation um, and transfer limited powers to GTCNI was brought to, the, to yourselves mm -hmm. on the 2nd of July, and we appreciate uh, that the committee wished to hear the Council's view on the matter before approving it. And we also appreciate that you wish to, hold, uh, to hear about our uh, resource position also before approving it. Um, so just to let you know that the Council debated the matter fully on Friday last mm -hmm. and, and that uh, they voted almost unanimously uh, to support the proposed amendment. Um, in fact, we welcome the opportunity to take on limited regulatory powers in advance of full powers mm -hmm. coming through, hopefully, the GTCNI bill. Um, we highlight that 99.9 per .9 cent of teachers abide by the Code of Professional Conduct, right. and therefore we believe that only a very limited number of cases have, um, have come before mm -hmm. DE for scrutiny, uh, I think in, the, in effect less than 10 and two or three on which to make judgments on. So we don't consider that the task will be onerous or that investigation will be needed, you know, um, detailed investigatory powers as judgments will have been made elsewhere. So rather, we just have to set up a screening process to determine whether the breach uh, of conduct um, um, is over a, th a particular threshold um, um, of unprofessional behaviour that would require removal from the register. Um, now, that will require the Council to develop processes and train a small number of obviously our own staff and council members to operate those processes. And all this preparation is underway um, because we are, we are building up for the main bill anyway. Um, but we, we stress that we cannot finalise those processes until we see the final regulations. Um, and then we will signal to DE when we are ready for a commencement order on the regulations. Um, uh, before that, we will seek written assurance or or when we will be ready to pick up, you know, okay. when our processes are in place. Um, we will be seeking some written reassurance from DE that any um, legal liability arising from previous okay. decisions will, will remain with them and will not come to GTCNI. So generally, just happy to report that uh, we, we, we do wish to take on the responsibility in order to be give, be, to give the Minister of the Assembly and general public reassurance that the Very profession good. is being regulated. Do you see any need for extra resources in the future of, over legal challenges? And yes. Well, in, in relation to our own staffing, then we're glad to report after 16 months that a business case has been approved by Good. DE and DFP and also by our council on Friday. But that will take some time to implement, um, and it will not result in additional staff mm -hmm. to the council because the current numbers is all that we can afford under the current um, fee structure. However, we do have reserves, and we we, we did report to you last year we have reserves of about 1.2 million. But we are are. Our liaison with other GTCs mm -hmm. indicate that you need that reserve um, for specific um, regulatory processes in the future, um, for capital expenditure, significant capital expenditure on our new database, which we will need to take on the FE um, um, extension of our powers to the mm -hmm. FE sector. And uh, our lease is up on our building as well, and we possibly require new premises. And uh, as well, potentially an independent body in the future, we would like to, you know, to think very soundly about what the, the nature of those pre premises in the long term. Um, so what we would say in terms of, uh, of our, our remit is that when we get our staff restructure in place, we can fulfil our remit, mm -hmm. um, but that we will need more staff as regulation kicks in. We will need to build up more staff, and therefore we are likely to need an increase in the registration fee, which has remained static for 10 years. Now, we have brought this matter to our Council and to, uh, to discussions with DE, and we will be setting up a working group within our own Council to um, consider the matter for, further. Um, but there was just one matter we wanted to raise with you in relation to um, current resources, mm -hmm. current financial resources, and that is that in the past, um, DE commissioned advice from GTC and I, and obviously paid paid for that advice. However, since we have been self-funding, mm -hmm. we are still required to provide that advice, but more or less free and gratis. Now, if we were able to, if that advice was able to be commissioned, 
um, we, we could possibly get some income from DE that would allow us to put um, staff in place to, to do specific things at specific times. So we, we believe that will be taken care of in the new bill. Mm -hmm. So we're just drawing that to your attention, that putting down a marker that we would hope that in future we would be commissioned for those pieces of work. Um, but in general, yes, I think our, our resources are okay at present, but we will be bringing forward this matter of an uplift in fee um, for approval in the future. Thank you for that. Uplift in fee, will you consult with teachers? Obviously, we yeah. have to consult with teachers, their unions, and... Uh, yeah. Talk of resources, it looks to me if it's quite a lot of extra resources that are needed, if it's new staff, new building, and yes, the and IT. Just, just to reiterate, um, you know, the figures that we gave to the committee last time round, that um, we employ 16 staff. Right. Um, Wales currently employ 28 staff, mm -hmm. and Scotland, as well, Ireland, 44, mm -hmm. and Scotland closer to 60. So we are by far the least resourced um, of the councils. Obviously, we we haven't got the regulatory powers as yet, but as we move forward, certainly there will be a need to provide um, additional resources. And do you see the transfer of this role as the right thing to be doing? It shouldn't be left with the department. Um, we, we believe that the department would have to legislate on that matter, um, and that, they obviously, that your intention, their intention, mm -hmm. the minister's intention is to transfer that power to, yeah. those power to us fully within two years. So mm -hmm. we do uh, consider, the council has debated it, and considers that right it would be appropriate, almost as a practice run. Okay. There is the, we'll be looking after this area, Very good, yeah. so if he would not like to say anything. Well, certainly, just to reiterate what Carmel said, the council did endorse um, the view that the council mm -hmm. should take on this responsibility. It seems to be wholly appropriate that right. the profession in Northern Ireland should be self-regulating. Um, self-regulation is both a responsibility mm -hmm. and a privilege, and it's a responsibility and a privilege that the council um, was set up to um, make happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Carmen made reference there to premises. I mean, this is something mm -hmm. that I have talked with her before uh, since she came into post and with the previous registrars. Um, we need to be fit for purpose. Absolutely. Present building is not fit for purpose. Uh, GTC Scotland, which has been, if you like, in the vanguard of this mm -hmm. for years, I was surprised to hear them. I think their facilities are very good, but they would still say their facilities aren't mm -hmm. right and they're looking to tweak it. So there's a lot tied up with that alone, bearing in mind what we'd be moving into, you know, dealing with people who are maybe heading towards certain disciplinary cases and so on. It has to be done right in the right environment, in the right way, and it, it's going to cost to actually set that up properly. But, but given our difficult budgeting and resources at the moment, I don't want to see it delaying when it comes to the budget system, we're going to get, we'll need to know exactly what the sort of scale and size are that you want. Well, Chair, just to reinforce that the, 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 the building would be, would be financed by GTCNI, right. and, okay. and we are in the process mm -hmm. of um, drawing up a business mm -hmm. case and negotiating that with, uh, with DE, but the, we would be paying for that out of our reserves. Very good. I think okay. what the Chairman uh, is emphasising is that GTC Scotland actually bought their building. It's, worth, uh, yeah. it's now worth millions, but they find that um, even though it's a beautiful building, um, because we're, you're involved in semi-judicial processes mm -hmm. where you're almost keeping prosecution and defence apart, and you may even have media attention, that you do need a, need a building which is particularly designed for that type of purpose. Okay. And therefore, we'll be negotiating with the early on now to see what we, well, how we can build. But we will not be coming to you for those resources. Okay. And when we talk about an uplift in favour, we're talking about obviously the profession yep. um, helping to finance um, future regulation. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thanks. You're very welcome. Just to clarify for me, Carmel, are the powers associated with the proposed statutory rules simply a replication of what previously existed in the department? I'll hand that to Jerry. Um, they, they are basically the same power, but um, the process that the department operated, um, I don't think it would be appropriate for um, a professional body. So based on the, the regulations that will be made, we will then establish our own processes. The, the proce we will move from the secondary legislation to establishing our own rules. Our rules will outline our process. Um, but it's fundamentally the same power. At the minute, the Department of Education, um, de jure, or 
up until this was uncovered, the position in terms of eligibility to teach, the Department of Education had the sort of de jure um, role of granting eligibility to teach on the basis of the de facto assessment of teacher qualifications by um, the, the Council. Now, what has subsequently happened is that the concept of eligibility to teach no longer exists because of this problem with this, um, this power, which the Department has uncovered. So, therefore, what will happen is that the only sort of gatekeeping role in the teaching in Northern Ireland will be registration with the GTCNI. So, we approve qualifications to teach for Nor in Northern Ireland, and with this additional power, we will also have the power to remove eligibility for registration. So it's a similar <coughs> power, but modified for the context of um, the way a professional regulatory body would operate. Yeah, and you know, the likes of the protocols in the department, whether it's the, the training or referral or whatever, will, 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 will simply transfer from the department to yourselves? Well, through the chair, we have um, had initial discussions with the department. They have told us about their processes. They have um, a process for communicating with um, the disclosure and barring service, as we currently have. They have a process for um, communicating with the PSNI to receive PSNI referrals, and they have a process in place for receiving referrals from employing authorities. Now, we're at a very initial stage of preparation, but we will also have to put in protocols <coughs> with the SNI with employing authorities, so the communication will no longer go to the department. It will come directly to GPCNI. And tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm getting the feeling here that there's major resource implications in terms of you exercising these due duties if you don't get more money wherever it comes from, whether from the department or from your teachers. Well, certainly in the long term, in terms of full regulatory powers, these are not the full regulatory powers that we anticipate in the GTCNI bill. They're quite limited regulatory powers. Um, the department have informed us that the cases that they have been dealing with are few and far between. Um, so we think we can deal with this particular responsibility with the current resource. The big question in terms of the resource allocation will be when we assume full regulatory powers, which are much more extensive than this. This is simply about eligibility to register and teach in Northern Ireland. The full regulatory powers are much wider. Thank you. What's the reaction of the unions to this? I mean, if, if you're losing a day's pay, if I look at that, or whatever the fee ends up as, teachers presumably are going to be looking at what are they getting for it, but what, how have the unions reacted to the, the whole idea? Um, Chair, just to, um, and, and I, the Chairman may wish to come in, in on this as a member of a union, um, uh, or representing a union, but um, the unions have been a, a large representative part mm -hmm. of the council, have been generally supportive, as Jerry says, of the, of the desire for the, the, the profession to regulate itself. Okay, good. So, um, as as indicated by the vote on Friday, mm -hmm. uh, you know, virtually all of the unions were Good. supportive of the position, and obviously, um, you know, as we go forward, it is t it is consulting mm -hmm. with them and, and putting in place place processes that uh, they respect and approve of, because they too would not like to have teachers in the classroom who they who are deemed to be either Absolutely. in breach of professional conduct or in breach of competence mm -hmm. standards, and just to go back to Sean's point then that the future regulation will not only about be the, about these issues of breaches of conduct but it's actually about the whole issue of future of competence and whether or not a teacher is judged by their um, employer not to be meeting the mark in terms of competence standards and that's the kind of regulation that has increased massively for example in Wales mm -hmm. to the extent that Wales has become bankrupt uh, they have used up all of their um, significant resource and are now having um, they're now increasing their their registration not only to the FE sector but actually virtually to the whole of the education sector including you know classroom assistants um, and, uh, and all sorts of support people so they will um, while Scotland has about 
78,000 um, registrants, um, uh, mostly just teachers. Ireland has about 70,000. Mm -hmm. Wales will be taking on virtually the whole profession. They will also have about that number, whereas we're, we're actually only around 27. To, uh, we'll go up to perhaps near to 30,000 when we take on FE. So we'll always be very small in terms of our numbers, and therefore that does raise issues uh, in terms of our sur economic survival. Thank you, Trevor. If I, if I could just comment in support okay. of the, what Carmen said about unions, yes, I would support that totally. And it's ironic, I, we were sitting uh, listening when uh, the earlier presentation was going on, and uh, you made comment about time. I can remember sitting on the NITC, which is the Northern Ireland Teachers Council, in 2010, when all the unions were encouraging the department mm -hmm. to speed this process through. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank Here we are, four years on. Uh, Nothing has happened. So the, the unions would be for that, and all that Carmel said is okay. Okay, to thanks. the point. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, the, the, the competence word keeps coming up. Uh, but what has been the position and in, in up to date in terms of competence issues? I mean, is, does this new set of rules and regulations give you extra powers to deal with competence issues, or have you always had those powers? And if, if you have had them, were you able to use them? Um, I think um, I've can I just to maybe start off and say that um, the competence issues are dealt with by employers themselves. Mm -hmm. But, for example, if a teacher was found in, happened to be found incompetent in a school and was let go from that school, we would have no powers to then look at that person's record and consider whether or not they should remain on the register. Yeah. So that's what the new regulations mm -hmm. will do. Okay. They will say this person has been dismissed from this school for, for, for reasons of competence. It is now up to the professional body to consider whether or not that person perhaps needs to undertake training, yeah. needs uh, some support for a specific period of time. So it was all of those extra rules and regulations that were not, that were missed out in previous legislation that will be taken off taken care of in this legislation. There is that. Yeah. The, 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 you, you won't, you, in the past, would you, would you have had a situation where, let's say, the Board of Governors decided that a, a teacher was not sufficiently competent and it was doing people's harm in terms of their education, uh, and they wanted to dismiss them? I think this has actually been a very difficult thing to do. Um, you, you, you had no say in the matter. No. You just had to effectively strike them off, yeah. but now... We, we weren't allowed to strike them off, they were uh, not well, yeah, 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 but you know, but um, you, you couldn't go back to the school and say, well, look, hold on a minute, there may be a, a, a training, a retraining or development option here, you couldn't do that, no? Yeah. Through the chair, you know, the, 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 the employer has certain questions and a certain role in this, in terms of competence. The employer takes a decision as to whether or not an individual is competent to teach in a particular school. GTCNI will take a decision, decision as to whether or not an individual is competent enough to be a member of the profession in Northern Ireland. Yeah. You, you could have a scenario under a competence ruling that an individual is dismissed from a school but is still deemed to be competent to teach in another environment, and which yeah. is you know, quite appropriate in my opinion. Yeah, but that, that dismissal would be on the record. I mean, I would think it would be quite difficult for them to find a suitable environment. You know. Well, anyway, I have no problem with what you're, what's been offered here. Hey, Jonathan. Yeah, sure. I just want to welcome this development. And it's good to see you here again. We sat in the Board of Governors for years, Chair. Um, I find this interesting because I always felt that there was a major loophole here because I actually have come across this in that I've, I've actually seen teachers dismissed, in some cases dismissed, criminal charges coming about for whatever reason, them actually being charged, prosecuted, whatever, and yet you find out through third parties that maybe in two or three years' time they're actually employed in another school. Now, the criminal charges and the reasons as to why they were actually dismissed were very, very serious. So at the minute, you're telling me you've absolutely no way of deregistering those, those individuals, even if there's a criminal charge against them? Through the Chair, the current situation would be that um, if someone 
was found guilty of a serious criminal offence. The PSNI would inform the Department of Education. The Department of Education would then take a decision mm -hmm. as to whether or not someone should remain eligible to teach. You're aware that the, the Department has not had that power. So what will happen in the future if someone was convicted of a serious criminal offence, that would be the PSNI would um, communicate with GTCNI, and we would decide whether or not that person should continue to be eligible for registration as a teacher in Northern Ireland. Which is the whole point of today. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose, yeah. Chair, just to summarise that, that it, it therefore matters that there's a loophole, a, 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 there's a gap at the moment, and there's that no gap. powers exist, mm -hmm. and therefore that is why the Council feels it's its moral duty yeah. to pick up this this matter and, and give cover to the Minister, the, uh, the Committee, the Assembly, the public. Mm. That, uh, well, I, I think you're absolutely right, Carmel, because yeah. I agree. I know the powers exist, but whether the powers are exercised properly is another matter. Uh -huh. And at least with yourselves, the, you'd be open to scrutiny as to how that is actually done. So I welcome that development. Thank you. Thank you. Trevor. It's just, uh, uh, it baffles me about how the current situation has been allowed to exist for so long. Effectively, you, you, could, you could refuse to register a new teacher under your current reg regulations, but you couldn't deregister an existing teacher. You know, well, we, we, the only way we can um, deregister someone is if we are informed by the Department of Education that they have removed their eligibility to teach. Now, obviously, that is why we're in this position, mm -hmm. because the department no longer or hasn't had the power to deal with that. So, you know, we would have received communications from the Department of Education that an individual's eligibility to teach had been removed. We would have put a restriction on their registration record. That was that's the, the current mm -hmm. process that is in operation. Hey, how long is that? What, what regulation do you operate under currently? Well, we the department operates under the 1997 um, eligibility to teach regulations. We operate under our own registration regulations. Yeah, yeah. So that's a situation that has pertained for 17 years. Yep. So the onus is on us to I think, get it I think quickly. It's, uh, it's Chair, which is why it'll be extremely important that you scrutinise yeah. the GTCNI bill because it was the 1998 order, the 2002 mm -hmm. order, and the 2006 order that all kind of missed yeah. the, the need for very specific um, details in terms of uh, regulation, and that we believe that this bill now is being, you know, very tightly monitored to ensure that yeah. it does pick it up does. on all these issues. It does amazing, mm -hmm. Chairman, how when you think of the, the amount of time it's spent. Uh, constructing and scrutinising legislation in this country. That's, mm -hmm. that, something like that could be missed, not just once, but three or four times. I think, Chair, that, that's the, the merits of a, of a bespoke bill, yeah. because before GTCNI was always a little small element of a much larger education bill, and therefore that's the merit of us having our own Thank specifically. You, and we're so glad that it wasn't part of the ESA bill. <laughs> Oh, well, now you were doing okay until that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, some of, the other, the chair, some of the other bills were brought through as order in council, so maybe they didn't get the same level of um, scrutiny. Yeah. Right. Well, very good. Well, look, thank you. Thanks very much thank for being very, very clear. Thanks, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Jerry, you. thank you very much indeed. Just been struck off my list. <laughs> <laughs>
Constitution Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2014, and subject to the ESR's report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. So, Chair, the other rule then, which is at page 65, this is still a draft rule. Um, this was um, also brought to the committee on the 2nd of July. Members found this a little more um, concerning. Uh, we're not content at that point for it to be um, made or laid until they had got further information. And what this does is what the um, GTC have just told you about, which is um, correcting an error uh, where um, the relevant powers to deregisters were accidentally repealed um, by the department in 2009. Um, so, Chair, the question is whether members are having got the background mm -hmm. now. Are they now content for that rule to be made? Are you actually saying they they lost the powers to deregister someone? Yeah. So, the the scenario that I spoke of there could actually have come about because they hadn't got the authority to actually deregister them. Uh, I think what, what the witnesses indicated um, was that uh, it's the department that um, uh, determines whether a teacher is eligible or not, and there are powers associated with that in legislation. They accidentally repealed those, so they had two or three teachers. I don't know what the circumstances were, um, but um, they were presumably their employment was terminated. They were deregistered by the department, but the department did not have the virus to mm -hmm. do that. So the position is, I think what Cornwall said was, put the case that a teacher does something they really shouldn't at school. PSNI brings to the court their criminal charges, their employer sacks them. They're still a registered teacher. But there's no powers to deregister yeah. them. So in theory, <laughs> so, so in theory, I was right mm -hmm. because I was aware of one case in particular, and I couldn't understand whether they were still on the register. Mm -hmm. I, I think the department only discovered this mm -hmm. very right. recently. But I don't know yeah, why yeah, the person is still on the register. Oh, it, is, it is recent, yes, yeah. and they're still on the register. They are. Yeah. Well, well, then it's for members to decide on that basis. Yes, I agree. <laughs> there is, there's consensus, <laughs> is there? Um, so you're happy then to determine uh, that the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland Registration of Teachers Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2014, be made? Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. <coughs> and then we move on. Um, we'll now have a briefing from the Regional Training Unit on their emotional health and well-being pilot study. The clerk's cover note is at pages 80 to 87. You'll also find a briefing paper, the report on the pilot study and related department correspondence. So, Dr. Ted Hesketh, Ted, you're very, very welcome. And thank you. Thank you. We haven't been waiting too long. Um, Dr. Hesketh is the director of the uh, regional training unit. So thank you very much. You have up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and uh, members. Good morning. Um, I appreciate the committee's interest. Uh, emotional health and wellbeing, I believe, has the potential to contribute significantly to our shared aim of a schooling system in Northern Ireland, which meets the needs and aspirations of pupils and wider society. Uh, not just in terms of better educational outcomes, but better social policy outcomes also. As part of today's meeting, I've provided a briefing paper which seeks to convey the rationale for emotional health and well-being, including as a powerful underpinning to achievement, employability and skills that our young people need to cope with the demands of a rapidly changing society. The compelling case for emotional health and well-being coming out of both an education and health societal context has also been provided. And I have provided what we have called a four-part model uh, by which emotional health and well-being can be successfully embedded within schools and indeed across the schooling system. Uh, you will also recall my communications earlier this year. These consisted of a copy of the evaluation a report into EHWB and also an update uh, via a letter to the committee on where we believed the project was as of April 2014. My opening remarks this morning, Chair and colleagues, are in essence 
a blend of all that has been forwarded thus far. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of the need to avoid any replication of what has already been provided. I do, though, w welcome warmly the opportunity to engage directly with committee members on this topic. So, with your permission, uh, Chairperson, I will briefly restate the case for emotional health and wellbeing, outline how it works in terms of the uh, policy, essentially how mm -hmm. it fits in with the wider policy framework, and also how it fits in with the work that RTU is privileged to take forward across our system, particularly in relation to leadership development. Uh, global research over the past two decades on the promotion of emotional health and well-being in schools demonstrates repeatedly that emotional health and well-being impacts positively on quite an impressive agenda. School improvement, academic learning, pupil engagement and motivation, school connectedness, behaviour and attendance, staff and pupil mental health, health outcomes, staff retention and morale. The evidence is unequivocal. A focus on well-being of both staff and pupils enhances learning outcomes, positive behaviours and staff effectiveness. And the case for emotional health and well-being is predicated, it seems to me, on a number of very powerful propositions. First of all, it is predicated on need. I think the mental health statistics across our community I bear witness to that. It is also predicated on educational grounds. I think it is a proven pathway to optimising the learning of pupils. It is also a proven pathway to providing pupils with the kind of learning and kind of development which is in keeping with a 21st century preparation for living in the context that we are in. I think it is also predicated too on quite powerful economic grounds in that emotional health and well being in part is about providing our young folk with the skills for employability and as I say for living in an increasingly globalized context. I have been privileged to have been involved in the department's emotional health and well being agenda as chair of one of the five work streams which were set up by the department to advance what used to be called PHA, now referred to as I Matters. And there has been considerable progress across the work streams on a number of fronts. We have an agreed definition of emotional health and well-being. We have ongoing work on audit tools and on identifying existing good practice within our schooling system, which will enable schools to assess how well they are doing mm -hmm. and to map their improvement agenda. There has been a distribution of posters and leaflets and homework diary inserts and other materials directly to our young people themselves on a whole range of issues to do with drug use, bullying, family problems, coping with stress. There has been the dissemination to schools of a new guide on managing critical incidents. And there is, I think, an enhanced knowledge across the schooling system of the wide panoply of other agencies and other bodies, statutory, voluntary, which are involved in the whole area of emotional health and well-being, from which schools, increasing clarity and knowledge, can access support. I am also aware of the Department's support for a dedicated independent counselling service, which makes available qualified counsellors to all post-primary schools. And there is to a professional welfare service available to all primary pupils through education and library boards. We have a better understanding, too, of the good work already going on at school level mm -hmm. to promote emotional health and well-being. And I think a major strength for our schooling system is the fact that our curriculum here in Northern Ireland has embedded within it emotional health and well-being mm -hmm. skills and attitudes and behaviours, which obviously it is an entitlement for all of our pupils to be able to access. But perhaps the key agenda transcending all of this is to find ways by which we can get emotional health and well-being to every pupil. And we believe that this is primarily the outworking of two interrelated strands. There is firstly the need for the teaching and reinforcement 
of specific related skills, what we refer to as social and emotional learning, managing our feelings, dealing with conflict, assertiveness, setting and achieving goals. But this needs to be done within the context of a safe, caring and supporting learning environment. And although, as I've indicated above, we have many of the building blocks for success in this area, a key prerequisite in achieving pupil emotional health and wellbeing in our schooling system is in the area of building leadership and also teacher capacity. We have advised a whole school approach in which the agenda is led from within by principal and leadership staff, that it is anchored in the processes of self-evaluation and self-improvement, which have become embedded within our system, but that the agenda can be taken forward on resources and support which schools will be able to access. And in that respect, the key component of our output has been a resource pack, the production of which was headed up by Mrs Shauna Cathcart, who is principal of St Paul's Primary School in Irvingstown, whilst on secondment to RTU. And this pack, these materials, were funded initially by Atlantic Philanthropies monies and then jointly by funding from the department and also from Bernardo's. Uh, we've been fortunate to have public health agency funding to facilitate across 15 schools the field testing of the materials and their underpinning methodologies. And this has been referred to as the emotional health and wellbeing pilot. The resource pack has attracted acclaim both locally and nationally. It is anchored in a robust body of evidence on the conditions necessary for successful emotional health and well-being outcomes, and is predicated on a four-part model for promoting EHWB in school, developing the whole school and classroom ethos, implementing an explicit SEL curriculum, staff emotional health and well-being and role modelling, and then reinforcing the explicit social and emotional learning curriculum in the way in which the culture, the ethos and the atmosphere that pervades around the school generally. As with most change agendas in schools, a key underpinning principle of our thinking and work on emotional health and well-being is the necessity for it to be driven by school leaders. And it is here, Chair and, and members, that we believe we touch something quite fundamental about school improvement and school effectiveness. The power of emotional health and wellbeing, not just to optimise pupils' learning, but also as a way of optimising two of the prerequisites so crucial to pupil learning, namely leadership efficacy and also teacher efficacy. I'm pleased to report that evidence from the PHA RTU funded field testing, collected both by ourselves and subsequently by ETI, confirms that the resources and their accompanying advice and insights provide schools with much that is required to allow them to move meaningfully and with impact in the direction of becoming an emotional health and well-being school. And our system has already some very notable Exemplars in Therese de Leisure, for example, primary school, and the Antrim Road and Carrickfergus College. And there are others uh, who have shown that this is a journey that can be undertaken with significant effectiveness and significant impact. I believe that what has been accomplished so far, both across the different work streams and through the Optimising Achievement resource, places the Northern Ireland schooling system in a good position to realise the aims and objectives of iMatters and more widely. In relation to the resource pack, finally, Chair and colleagues, the challenge is to move beyond the field testing which is being conducted, including to learn from that process, and to devise a cost-effective rollout strategy by which we can facilitate the engagement of an increasing number of schools with the emotional health and wellbeing agenda. We are currently developing proposals to be put to the department to this effect. These strategies will need to be consistent with the emergent CPD models and the wider infrastructural changes within our schooling system, such as, for example, area learning communities. Mm -hmm. They will need to be consistent, too, with our ongoing work on leadership development 
given that we see leadership as pivotal in moving this agenda forward. And I think the cross-departmental relevance of emotional health and well-being as just one element in a wider health and social well-being agenda identifies emotional health and well-being as a potentially powerful action area for the recently announced cross-departmental education action zone centred on the Shankill, but which potentially could be applied mm -hmm. to similar, other similar contexts yeah. within Northern Ireland. I thank you, Chair and colleagues, for your time and your attention this morning, and uh, I'd like to leave it there. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, it raises a, a lot of questions, and I can't believe that before you started that it didn't exist. The um, pack you have beside you, is that not part of teacher training? Is not because it strikes me that you'd expect every teacher to be trained in it as part of their training system and then throughout their career to then be refreshed and then you get into the CPD and getting more time and response and then the inspection process checking that it happens and it really being just part of the day-to-day -day life. How, how do we get it there? I mean, you, you're going to come up with your proposals and we'll then see them back here, but what, what are the major blocks, do you think, to, to it happening? Or? Well, the Chair and members, we are, as I say, working on, on proposals by which we can begin the process by which the materials and potentially their use can uh, begin to permeate our schooling system at the number of levels that you have been referring to in terms of initial teacher training, but also much more critically in terms of usage by individual schools mm -hmm. uh, aligned to a school improvement agenda. Um, the materials are of relatively recent production. Yeah. Uh, we have just been able this year in the January to March period with public health agency funding to field test the materials and I think that was a necessary mm -hmm. step that needs to be taken before one would move in the direction of perhaps making the materials more widely available across the schooling system. Um, I think the other, and it's not an impediment, mm -hmm. I think it's a consideration that needed to be borne in mind, uh, is essentially one to do with timing and one to do with the direction of travel, which the department itself is taking yep. in relation to this agenda. Uh, the department, rightly, I think, is off a view that there is value in investing in what will be an auditing mm -hmm. tool so that schools will be able themselves to audit where they perhaps are currently in relation to having a curriculum which meets the emotional yeah. health and well-being kind of standards and criteria. And there is an understanding that one of the mm -hmm. agendas which would need to be attended to post that audit would be the availability and the accessibility within the schooling system in terms of CPD materials, which will be able to underpin and enable schools to drive the improvement agenda, which will come from the audit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's to do with timing. I think it's to do with building in as much assurance and as much confidence as we possibly can that the materials are fit for purpose. I think it's also got to do with the fact that we operate within a schooling system within which there are many initiatives happening currently. And one always needs to be conscious of the extent to which uh, we avoid putting too much stress, too much additional expectation, too much additional workload on teachers and on schools. We don't think in relation to that last point, we don't think that that is as big an issue as it needs to be, because we don't see this as an initiative as I mentioned earlier, I think there is much already within mm -hmm. our schooling system in terms of the curriculum that our young folk are entitled to, in terms of the buy-in that we have across our system to the importance of pastoral care and the importance of relationships, to the importance of staff well-being as a means of promoting pupil well-being mm -hmm. and pupil attainment. Many of the building blocks, it seems to me, are there, which would enable this to move hopefully in a fairly seamless manner into the culture and the ethos and the processes that underpin what we mean by good schooling yeah. within the Northern Ireland schooling system. Thank you. Sean. 
If I welcome Tom, and first of all, could I acknowledge the, the good work that RTU do in terms of this emotional health and well-being, and particularly acknowledge the work of Sean and her team in, in putting this project together. I am very familiar and went through this with her. You know, I suppose my question really, really a couple of questions on it. One, um, could this material be rolled out to all schools throughout Northern Ireland on a cost-effective basis? And secondly, in terms of your feedback in the pilot, um, did post primaries or primaries seem to get more out of it? Well, in relation to the first uh, question, uh, Mr. Rogers, um, cost effectiveness, I think, is is our challenge uh, because we live in austere times, and the likelihood is that now and into the foreseeable future, the amount of money's resource and so forth, which we will be able to invest as a schooling system in continuous professional development is going to be obviously at, at a premium. And there are many, many other priorities within our schooling system alongside which emotional health and wellbeing needs to take its place. But I'm confident that with the emergent thinking that is taking place within our schooling system in terms of uh, more innovative ways by which CPD can be taken forward. Uh, I'm also confident with, for example, the potential of the new technologies and the capacity by which CPD... Essentially, we can move CPD away from what perhaps in the past may have been uh, an inset-heavy model, which is very much predicated on taking teachers and other uh, education professionals away from their workplace and developing them uh, all from, from the outside in. Uh, you know, I think there's much within our schooling system to do with self-evaluation, self-improvement, building capacity from within, collaboration, sharing, new approaches, as I say, to CPD, which would lead me confidently to the view that we can come up with cost-effective strategies by which these materials and resources and the insights and the powerful methodologies and so forth that underpin them, by which those can be permeated across the schooling system in such a way as we have the impact and the outcomes, which I think the emotional health and wellbeing agenda promises that we will be able to achieve those. And in terms of your feedback of the pilot in terms of primary versus post-primary, did you get anything? Well, the interesting, interesting, there. The interesting uh, point about that is that um, initially P Hall was um, taken forward by the department uh, very much centred on post-primary because it was very much tied up with the significant incidences of uh, suicide and so forth that was within our uh, community. So and when P Hall was first um, uh, conceived, as it were, within the department, the focus was very much to do with the sort of 11 to 14, 11 to 16 age range. And certainly we engaged in the whole process of producing materials and resources with that end point in mind. Um, but one of the outcomes coming out of the pilot is that the materials have proven to have a fitness for purpose aspect right across the entire range, primary, post-primary, um, secondary, uh, selective, um, special schools. I mean, we pointedly, in, in setting up the pilot uh, in the early part of this year, we pointedly uh, sought to um, disseminate and trial the materials across as wide a range of schools as possible. So the 15 schools that I mentioned actually encountered or en encompassed all of the different types of schools that, that are in our schooling system. There was nothing coming back from the feedback in terms of principals' response to the materials to indicate that they were better from the point of view of usage in a post-primary setting than a primary. Okay. Just one more. Mm -hmm. In terms of, I agree wholeheartedly with in terms of school improvement, for school improvement to be right, we must have a fact of teaching, a fact of learning. But to me, it's a bit like, it's a bit like the stool, where, where the stool itself, the seat, is a school improvement. To me, the three legs are the pupils, the, te the teachers and support staff, and the leadership. You know, when you do have, and you mentioned, when you do have a critical incident in your school, 
Mm. Uh, your emphasis is very much on, uh, and you use all your energy at, primarily with the pupils and with the staff. Uh, so the pupil gets, gets quite a bit of support. The staff get a limited amount of support. Senior leadership, you're, left, you're basically left on your own. Like if you're a councillor out there in the world, out in the world there, you go occasionally for supervision and that type of thing. So, you know, I think um, this is a fantastic project, but there has to be a strong emphasis on emotional health and well-being of all our teaching staff and, and also our, our senior leadership in schools. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more, Mr Rogers. And in many ways, I think that's the strength of the project in that it actually... Um, touches each of the agendas that you've mentioned. Um, the project right throughout virtually every aspect uh, that it seeks to take forward is anchored in robust evidence and in robust mm -hmm. research, uh, not just yeah. in Northern Ireland, but I think just as significantly globally. <coughs> um, so the, the proposition that emotional health and well-being actually improves pupil outcomes in all sorts of ways I mentioned earlier, it's anchored in evidence. The proposition, for example, that by working on the agenda of the emotional health and well-being of teachers and of other staff who work in schools, that that too translates into significant gains and advantages in terms of pupil outcomes. It too is anchored in evidence. You know, so throughout the um, pack, I think the team who put it together, as you say, headed up in a very significant and effective way by uh, Shona Cathcart. I think they have had their eye to what works best on this particular agenda globally and how can we contextualise this for the schooling system that we are all a part of. The materials draw heavily from the uh, latest thinking in terms of neuroscience about how individuals learn best. Mm -hmm. Um, it draws heavily, too, from the thinking, again, anchored in evidence about the kind of activities and actions which leaders need to be taking within schools so that you have the best possible connectedness between leadership activity and the core business of the school, which is to promote learning, and learning which is defined not just in terms of standards and academic achievement, but learning which also encompasses the emotional health and well-being outcomes that, as I say, we've already mentioned. So that, I think, should increase our schooling system's confidence that we have something which potentially is quite valuable in touching many of the key agendas within our schools, if we can find ways, cost-effective ways, by which this can be rolled out and made accessible to more and more of the education constituency. Does it touch on resilience? Does it touch on encouraging children to do the things that they don't really want to do so that they get involved and they get encouraged to have a go at everything and to take something on the chin and, and absolutely and, and, sure. and, and you know sometimes sometimes we fall into the trap I'm not saying that you're doing this but sometimes we fall into the trap of articulating these agendas in a sort of adult mm -hmm. uh, formulated language I think one of the key outcomes coming out of the, the IMATERS agenda, which our department have been promoting, is that they have been able to define emotional health and well-being in terms which uh, are essentially at the level of the pupil. So to answer your question in terms of what does it contain, uh, being mentally and emotionally healthy means that we believe in ourselves and know our own worth. Mm -hmm. We set ourselves goals that we can achieve and can find support to do this. We are aware of our emotions and what we are feeling and can understand why. We can cope with our change in emotions and we can speak about and manage our feelings. We understand what others may be feeling and know how to deal with their feelings. We also understand when to let go and not overreact. We know how to make friendships and relationships and how to cope with changes in them. We understand that everyone can be anxious, worried or sad sometimes and resilience we know how to cope with and bounce back from changes our problems and can talk about them to someone we trust. So that's bringing it down to the very practical, everyday level language and frames of understanding 
of young folk themselves. Okay, thank you. Maeve. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm just, uh, I mean, obviously the, the, the link with emotional health and well-being is, is critical to, I suppose, our society generally going forward, and, and sometimes it's getting that link um, between the, the, the outcomes that we require and, and, and health and education being, being joined up. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the, the schools or the pilot, yeah. and I don't, you may have touched on that, I may have missed it, but how, how were they identified? Or was there any criteria? Well, um, two responses to that, uh, Ms McLaughlin. Um, we initially went out and invited as many schools as wanted to express an interest to do so. And I, from memory, I think we ended up with about 120, 130 schools, which I think testifies to the extent to which within the schooling system there is already an acceptance on the part of many that this is an agenda that perhaps they should be looking at a little bit more critically and a little bit more systematically. I say a little bit more critically and a little bit more systematically because, as I mentioned already this morning, I do think that there is much of this already within our schools, there's got to be, because it is an embedded part of our curriculum in terms of the personal and social development, which underpins our primary curriculum and the preparation for life and adult working, which is an integral part mm -hmm. of post-primary. Um, so from that 130-odd schools expressing interest, as I say, we wanted to come up with a means by which the materials could be field-tested across the broad sweep. So we wanted to see what the response and the reaction would be, for example, from primary principals and staff, post-primary, <coughs> special schools, schools working in the Irish medium sector and so forth, integrated. So that really determined how, from the 130-odd expressions of interest, we ended up putting in place a group of 15, um, most of whom, all of whom, I think, were probably coming to this from, let's say, a position of not up to that point in time having given it any kind of a concerted action. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's a well-tried and tested approach to piloting initiatives within our schooling system. Generally, that, as I say, there's no point just focusing it very much on one part of the system to the exclusion of others. Our aim was to have as representative a group as possible. So what if um, issues like deprivation or need social need being part of that thinking around the identification of the 15? Well, I, I think that's where we need to be thinking in relation to rollout strategies. Um, because if we believe, as we do passionately, uh, in terms of the propositions that underpin the power of emotional health and well-being and its capacity to make an impact on young people across a broad range of both educational and social and health uh, issues, then I think it's incumbent on us, uh, not least because the rollout strategy will have to be staged, to look critically at finding ways by which this can get to the mm -hmm. young people in the contexts who need it most. And therefore, part of our proposals to the department in terms of rollout will actually focus very much on that agenda. Yeah, and I think, Chair, for me, that would also influence how cost-effective a process would be, and you know, because this will ultimately be about creating different outcomes, doing things differently, and creating different outcomes. And therefore, um, you know, you you would suggest, or I would suggest, that by targeting where the need exists, um, you are more likely to get yeah. a, a better outcome. Just interested as well in your thinking. I know you talked about the fact that it was the 11 to 11 to 16 year olds. I think you had mm -hmm. suggested because of specific issues there. But I'm just interested in, in your thoughts on this, Tom, because a lot of the the thinking across a number of departments, I think, currently is moving towards that early intervention model. Yes. Um, and you know the the huge debate about even preschool. Yes. Um, but I, but I'm wondering. In your view, would there be better educational and social outcomes for the child if the intervention in terms of this model was earlier? 
Yes. Well, I, I think as with all things in education in terms of pupil development and optimising the learning of pupils, I think the earlier the intervention in terms of removing the impediments to that learning, as many of the impediments as it is possible to remove, the earlier the intervention, I think the greater ultimately the return on the investment that is made. And I have no doubt that that uh, thinking applies every bit as much to emotional health and well-being as to any other part of the strategies that underpin early intervention. Um, but I think we're, we're working, I think, on a number of um, different uh, standpoints in relation to this. Um, I think a lot of this is to do with the entitlement of every pupil within our schooling system to have opportunities to develop in a way which is more in keeping with the challenges and the demands that we referred to when we referred to 21st century living. Um, so, you know, there is a sense in which I think by increasing the focus and, and giving greater emphasis to the agenda itself, the hope, the aspiration is that that is something which ultimately all pupils within our schooling system will benefit from. But I think alongside that, we also do need to have a critical uh, focus too on those young folk uh, who are living and, and uh, uh, being schooled in the kind of context where the problems that they are confronted by in terms of impediments to their learning are likely to be greater, greater in terms of the quantum, greater in terms of the range, and therefore the belief that by addressing emotional health and well-being with those young folk in those kind of contacts, mm. that the gains on that investment are going to be all the greater. Okay. And just one final mm -hmm. question, Chair. Thank you. Uh, one, of, one of the issues that we'd identified through the department, and, and John had referred to the, the issue around staff and teachers generally, but in terms of stress-related absence, for example, you mm -hmm. know, we were told that it's um, maybe 30 per cent of all teacher absence, but only around 4% is job-related. I'm wondering, in terms of that pilot, you know, did you, did you, could you endorse that view as a result of that pilot, or was that coming up at any, any level, those kind of 4% related to job? Well, I, I don't think from memory that it was something that we looked specifically at in relation to the pilot. I mean, I do have to say about the pilot that the pilot was um, limited in that its primary aim was to field test the materials. Um, if it was a full-blown evaluation of the capacity of emotional health and well-being to make the kind of impact within our system that we believe from other evidence mm -hmm. collected globally it can make, then the pilot would have had to have been perhaps conducted somewhat differently, and we would have had to have extended it over a much longer time frame so that some of that longitudinal data in terms of its impact on pupils, but also impact on staff in terms of morale, motivation, reductions in absenteeism and so forth, so that that data could have been much more forthcoming. Um, so there is a little bit, I think, in all of this on our part of an act of faith, um, and that's why I've stressed with colleagues this morning the importance of the global evidence that we have tried to anchor this in. The act of faith is that if you work on the agenda of pupil emotional health and well-being, you also will work and will also need to work on the emotional health and well-being agenda related to staff. And there is, I think, global evidence to indicate that staff well-being, when worked on in a systematic and critical and proactive way, uh, which is what we suggest, that that will have benefits from the point of view of morale, motivation, retention rates, but also absenteeism rates. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Trevor. Uh, thanks, thanks, Tom, for your presentation. Um, one, of the, one of the things that may not be directly related to what you've been telling us, but it's at least tangential. Um, uh, Low-level bullying, as I would call it, and particularly in primary schools, and I'm not talking about major stuff, you know. I mean, I mean niggling bullying. Do, do you think that schools and teachers and governors pay sufficient attention to that? And are you satisfied that 
in terms of acknowledging that it happens and the recording of it. And there, there's an issue about how it is recorded. And for mm -hmm. instance, this homophobic bullying is not required to be catalogued separately. Are you satisfied with that, that aspect of school activity? Well, I haven't, I haven't much evidence to go on to be able to come to a conclusion one way or the other on that. Um, I do know, though, uh, from what I know anecdotally, and, and as a result of having worked in our schooling system for a very long time, I do know that uh, pastoral care and ethos and pupil well-being is something which I think is already present within our schooling system. Uh, the emotional health and well-being approach that we're suggesting here uh, this morning seeks to move that on to a much more strategic, much more systematic, much more proactive footing. And therefore, I would have no doubt that if, for example, within schools there is this um, uh, incidence of, of bullying behaviour, that you know, the school, by focusing systematically and critically on the emotional health and well-being agenda generally, that that would be one of the expected outcomes yes. that as a result of so doing, that the instances of bullying and so forth uh, would be reduced. But the statistics in relation to just how much bullying there is out there, and I, I provided some of it in the uh, briefing paper to members. Find I mean, the statistics, I think, are quite unnerving. You know, uh, in a school of 1,000 pupils, there are likely to be <laughs> 50 with depression, uh, 10 affected by eating disorders, 100 experiencing significant distress, 10 to 20 with obsessive compulsive disorder, 5 to 10 attempting suicide. Um, for example, mental health statistics collected by the Centre for Effective Education in Queen's, 21% of 12, 13 year olds reported being bullied two, three times per month. Yes. Um, so I think you know, there is a lot about the culture of our society, the culture within our schooling and the culture in terms of our young people's behaviour, which an emotional health and well-being focus across our schooling system. Yes. There is a lot there that I think it can impact positively on. Yes. And, and, the, and the initial batch of statistics that you gave us there to do with uh, obsessive behaviour and potential suicide and distress. I mean, you'd have to assume that an awful lot of that is directly related to having been bullied. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I'm familiar with that. I put it this way: if, if if parents consult me about various things that may happen in school and a whole range of stuff, we all get them, you know. But it's surprising how many times you hear about what I would call low-level bullying. Mm -hmm. You know, pick, picking on people, mm -hmm. not not uh, not somebody getting hospitalised, you know, on the playground. I mean, just, just niggly stuff, which is, is very damaging to a child's concentration and self-esteem, you know. And I mean, I, I know of one situation where a, a, a particular pupil has gone through <coughs> primary school and caused a, a significant amount of mayhem <laughs> right through from P1 to P7. And, um, it, but it stopped completely. In, in two of those stages, because the teacher took it seriously. You see, that's where the, the research that I mentioned earlier and what we now know in terms of what's coming out of the neuroscience uh, profession um, is so telling in relation to all of this. And again, you know, some of this was mentioned in the briefing paper. But uh, we do know, for example, that distress and bullying can lead to feelings of distress and yes. insecurity and so forth, that distress kills learning. And when children do not have strategies for decreasing their anxiety, less attention is, avail is, is available to them to learn, solve problems and grasp new ideas. Scientists now believe that improving attention and memory, along with freeing the mind from impulsivity and distress, puts a child's mind in the best zone for learning. And I think that's one of the significant aspects of this particular work that, you know, it is genuinely, it seems to me, uh, full of insight, full of strategies, full of approaches, anchored in evidence about how schools can create what we call optimal states for learning so that you optimise the potential learning 
of your pupils by attending to that emotional side. And, you know, as many colleagues will know, good teaching is partly cognitive, it's partly physical, but it's also partly emotional. And good teachers, it seems to me, have always known that if they attend to the emotional climate within their classroom, and that embraces aspects to do with relationships and respect and values and so forth, good teachers know that in that kind of a climate, that is an optimal climate within which learning will be optimised. Yeah. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure the way that you're going about it is probably the, the best and perhaps the only way, and see it as a long-term project and all the rest of it. But I, mean, I know that teachers have an awful lot on their plate, and sometimes they have bigger classes than they ideally have and all the rest of it. But uh, I do believe, at, certainly at primary level, that you know, emotional distress amongst pupils, particularly last day pupils who have been doing well and suddenly take a darn turn downturn. And that that's easily spotted. And there's often a reason for it. I mean I, I know of a case where uh, uh, the situation got so bad that a parent removed her two children from a primary school. But there was still nothing done about the cause. Yeah. You know, and that that's that's bad, you know. I well Wish you luck with your, <laughs> your efforts. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Tom. That's been really interesting. Um, and all those targets and goals that you referred to earlier, I can totally relate to. I was a mother of an 11-year-old mm -hmm. and a 13-year-old, and how they need to adapt and change to the post-primary um, situation and all those challenges that that come with that. Um, and so, you know, that family support I think is really important, mm -hmm. and how. Um, what what are you propose um, you know to do to try and roll that out to the whole family environment or to you know to give those children that support in both aspects? Yeah, we would. Um, I mean, thank you for that question. Those those comments. Um, we have approached this. I think um, you know, given what I mentioned earlier about how we now operate within a schooling system where the the prevailing orthodoxy is very much centred on school self evaluation school self-improvement, uh, schools developing capacities from within to move their agendas forward. And one of the key uh, learning uh, points that has come out of this agenda so far is that while schools might look at this initially as something to do with pupils' emotional health and well-being, they very quickly catch on to the uh, concept that well, we really can't advance that agenda forward all that much unless we work on two other agendas. One we have mentioned a lot this morning, which is to do with staff, emotional health and well-being, but alongside that there is parents, emotional health and well-being, and what it is that is happening in that 82 per cent of time when our young folk are not in school, what is actually happening in those contexts centred on the family, centred on their community, which can actually create the kind of uh, negative behaviours and impulses and distress and anxiety which is going to impede learning for them, not just in school uh, but outside. So this is very much in the ownership of schools and what I think schools will see the need to do is to find ways by which they can bring parents into the emotional health and well-being agenda by explaining to parents and working closely with parents about the connectedness of young peoples in terms of their self-image and their self-esteem and their self-awareness and their resilience and their perseverance and their patience and their capacity to work with others. The importance of all of that for their learning and for their more rounded development. And you know, if we believe as we do that schools on their own cannot advance the learning agenda and that they therefore need to see this, I think it was mentioned earlier by Mr Rogers, as something which they do in partnership with others and particularly parents in the community, then I think schools, because they own this, because this is an entitlement, this is a curricular part of the entitlement of every pupil, I think they will find ways by which they can engage parents too in the agendas that come out of this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chair, I just w wondered you know, about the teaching unions and employing authorities. Have they um, 
been involved at all? Or have they have they looked at the the program, the materials? Such have they? Yes, the uh, again uh, was over in the the uh, the buy-in um, uh, across our, our community, not just within education but also within health sectors. I think has been quite impressive. I mean, I've already mentioned that we've been able to attract public health agency funding. Yes. The working group which I chaired, which looked very specifically at the whole issue of teacher capacity building, school capacity building, itself was multidisciplinary and multi-agency. And the teaching associations, uh, they uh, have actually uh, featured on emotional health and well-being in the last number of months as part of their annual conferences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom, thank you very much indeed. Um, like I've, I've learned a great deal of today as well. So thank you for all your hard work and coming here today. And we'll discuss how we take this forward and push it. So thank you. Thank you thank for you the time. Turn. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Does anyone want to see the document? Is that the only copy you've got of that? It, it's not just the only copy that I've got. It's the only copy that uh, basically we have <laughs> okay. in the system. But um, certainly, I'd be happy to leave it for members to become <coughs> is familiar there, with. Um, is there a web link on it? Is that set up yet? Well, I, I think that's one of the challenges. One of the challenges is to find ways by which, partly through web, partly through online. Uh, I had a very exciting session with um, Every School a Good School TV mm -hmm. yesterday afternoon, Peter Simpson and his team, where we were looking at ways by which we can find very effective ways of making this as accessible to as wide a part of the teaching community and others as possible. But I, I'm very happy to leave this which with we have to leave today, it and then we can okay, thank have you ways by which it can be retrieved. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. Well, Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. It will be there and he'll be an executive somewhere. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was going to ask you, Trevor, to read it and summarise it for us. The cynic covers in part of phases, yeah. that's why it's so big. It's um, uh, resume. So, our further action. So, Chair, yeah, the uh, Department is going to brief on the I Matter strategy mm. in clarity on the mm. 26th of November. So, this pilot study was, I think that's working group two mm -hmm. of five working groups members heard in the last session from NSPC about uh, preventative education. Um, so, the Department will come and talk about all of this on 26th of November. And, um, so, we're happy to leave it to then and then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I can move on then to correspondence at pages 131 to 152, where we have nine items uh, provided under correspondence and one tabled item. At page 139, you'll see correspondence from a member of the public regarding the extension of free school meals to all young primary school children in England and a consequential additional finance for Northern Ireland. Uh, the Department of Education previously advised that the associated consequential would be 38.3 million resource and capital over 2014-15 and 2015-16. And I propose that we write to DFP seeking clarity as to whether the additional money will be allocated yep. to the educational budget. I, mean, I, get it, I raised this in a, one of the budget debates as well. Okay, is that agreed? Yeah. Um, may I suggest that we dispose of the correspondence as per the covering sheets on page 129 to 130? Agreed? Yeah, agreed. Okay. Thank you. In tabled items, we have correspondence from the Belfast Education Library Board inviting members to attend the launch of the defibrillator guidance to schools. This is on 24th September 2014. I propose that we note this correspondence. Agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Any items of correspondence anyone else wants to raise? No. Okay. Forward work program. Um, just to remind members, the committee will meet with the chairperson of the independent um, DE and DEL um, careers review panel on Tuesday, 23rd of September at around 12.30 in room 21. Lunch will be provided. The report of the panel is expected to be issued in October. I have confirmed my attendance. Could members please advise the committee staff if they wish to attend? Uh, yeah. Sorry, it was something on the forward work programme. Okay, go on, raise it now. It's just it's in the pack. Uh, the minister wants to come and 
brief us or plead with us to yep. seek accelerated passage for the new bill. It's just to say that there'll be three of us not here that day. Between Mr. Rogers and Mr. Long. Right. Okay. Um, I forgot what the date we come to this. Next it's, Wednesday. it's next Wednesday. Um, um, I'm saying don't go ahead, but it's just a fact that three of us are okay. on the same yeah. plane. You know? Yeah. Okay. I think we want to do it as quickly as possible. Yeah. I think the department wants to do it as quickly as mm. possible. It is for the committee to, to uh, agree its own agenda. I think the, uh, the department uh, wants to bring the, uh, well, the minister wants to bring the bill through by accelerated passage. So they want to introduce it as soon as possible. And um, standing orders requires that the minister comes and explains to the committee and he's asked to come on that date, but it's for the committee to decide. So are you saying you would like it delayed a week? Well, I'm not sure if, Two things as well. I'm not sure that uh, his request for accelerated passage would be universally well received. That's the first thing. Second, yep. And secondly, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's. Been, I don't know what the procedure is, frankly. But uh, are we not entitled to see the bill before we agree that it should have accelerated pass? Very good point. You know, so is it good, Chair, that the papers will be provided shortly um, from yeah. the department? That's what they promised me. And I anticipate that that will include the bill. That'll be at ten, five to ten next Wednesday. <laughs> well, so the, the officials did tell me Thursday or Friday they would provide um, the, the papers. Can, can we ask then if it can be done the following week? Is that what the committee would like? Well, it's up to the committee. I've, I've asked officials. In fact, Chairperson, I suggested this to officials for various yeah. other reasons, not not necessarily our our timetable, but they are extraordinarily keen. That would be the 24th of September, but it is for the committee to decide its, um, its own um, timetable. Well, that, that's three definite absences, and we don't know who else may or may not be able to be here. So, no. I, I would agree with, with Trevor on that. I certainly would like to be able to attend that briefing. And well, I think we should have as many people here as, yeah. as, as we can mm -hmm. possibly get. You happy with that then? So, we asked them then if we could have it the following week. Or would members be agreeable to, because we're not planning on having a meeting the following week, oh, okay. um, there is a, uh, we're going to have a briefing on Tuesday on the October monitoring round. I could ask the department would, if that would do. We would do it at lunchtime on the Tuesday. Absolutely. I mean, do it at lunchtime, yeah. yeah. One issue meeting, that might not. Okay. Yeah. okay, will you come back to us then? Yes, Chair. <coughs> okay. Um, I have business committee at 12.30 on Tuesdays. Well, so we can... Yeah, those will be out. Fifteen minutes. Yes, yeah. we could say twelve forty-five. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. So prior to next week's meeting, financial scrutiny training will take place at nine thirty on Wednesday, twenty-fourth September, in room thirty with Dell Committee. Members will be forwarded a link prior to this meeting, which will allow them to access their papers through SkyDrive Pro. Would members please advise committee staff that are able to attend the session? I'm I'm doing it with another committee already before that. I'm waving to do that. Well, I'll, we'll, we'll I'll put it together. Okay. okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, we've dealt with the next matter. Um, members will recall that the committee agreed to meet the Professor Kirk, um, a member of the Teacher Education Infrastructure Independent Review Panel, to discuss relevant aspects of the report. Um, are you going to explain? Briefly, then, members. Sorry about this at all. It seems to have happened on the 24th of September. It wasn't my intention, but. Um, the final report of the uh, panel on initial teacher education infrastructure was commissioned by the Dell Minister. It deals with Dell responsibilities, but it also makes a number of other comments about these responsibilities. For example, they say the teacher or suggest that teacher education, including CPD and infrastructure, should fall to one department, not two, as it currently is. They talk about a strategic body concerned with education, the so-called Northern Ireland Teachers Education Advisory Council. Um, they. Um, are critical of DE's practice of allowing what they describe as high levels of student teacher mm -hmm. recruitment to ITE colleges above the level predicted by the teacher demand yeah. model. They're critical of current arrangements for Stramillus students uh, getting access to a certificate of religious education. They talk about the one year PGCE becoming a two year master's, and they are very keen that shared education form a compulsory part of initial mm. teacher education and indeed CPD. So those are actually DE responsibilities. The plan had been that when Professor Kirk and Professor or seeing the Dell committee next week, that they would meet with members at lunchtime. Um, I think the chair has, and the deputy chair have confirmed, so yeah. members are, can, well, they're going to be here anyway. I, I guess if members then decided they wanted a formal briefing, 
subsequent formal briefing we could do that. But just I am conscious that this is a bit of a train wreck in terms of the 24th of September. Didn't realise we were going to lose that many members on that day. Um, so, okay, can we give him some chance to brief us as we're having lunch? Yes. So we set it in such a way so he gets a chance to. You might not get any food, but you can talk to us. <laughs> Indeed, yes, Chair. Okay. Um, Whatever. Okay, thank you. In the table board work programme, the clerks provisionally added a few more evidence sessions for our inquiry. Parenting NI will give evidence on the 5th of November. The Queen's University Belfast Centre for Shared Education will attend on the 26th of November 2014. Additionally, NICE has offered to give evidence on the 19th of November. NICE is to arrange an integrated schools parliament on the 3rd of December 2014, probably in a venue in Queen's University. This is designed to allow members to meet with pupils and hear their views firsthand. Um, the clerk intends to arrange a similar event for those schools involved in shared education. And the NICE has also proposed a committee visit to Glen Craig Integrated Primary School in Bangor on the 26th of November. And those all sound really good things to be in, involved in. Um, are you happy with the draft work programme? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any other business? Thank you. Um, so next meeting is uh, financial scrutiny training at 9.30 in room 30 on Wednesday the 24th, with us then moving here 10 o'clock to the Senate on Wednesday the 24th. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.